think there are two sermons this morning, not one sermon broken up by an offertory, but each sermon is not 20 minutes, so <laughs> relax. And the first sermon I didn't write. The first sermon is written in the form of a story, is a story composed and told by a friend of mine, or to be more exact, by the husband of my wife's friend. These words were written, composed, to give you context as part of a longer piece, which was composed about eight weeks ago, on the date that the United States announced it would be withdrawing troops from the Kurdish region, located on the borders of Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. These words were composed as the Turkish Air Force began the bombing of Kurdish civilians. And I ask that you listen to these words that I'll be speaking, but using the voice of my friend, Nasser Asa. Until very recently, my family and I lived roughly 30 yards from the Mar Sargas Assyrian Church here on the north side of Chicago. Kurdish Christians. The congregation, spanning at least three generations, is from all over. Iraq, Syria, southern Turkey, Schomburg, Skokie, and Arlington Heights. Sunday mornings on our street always began with a parliament of smartly dressed, second-hand, bends-driving, mustachioed old men who fought my neighbors and I like wild animals for the few free parking spots on the street. They were proudly Kurdish. They spoke an old polyglot language that, while distinct, was peppered with Aramaic, Greek, Arabic, classical Turkish, old Persian, very old Assyrian, and amazingly, a bit of Urdu Hindi. The Kurds, they go back a very long time. The middle-aged guys were of a more recent vintage. One in every ten or so bore the marks of something terrible that, to be honest, I always looked away from. They were veterans of the Iran-Iraq War, drafted by both sides, as well as desperate fights against Saddam Hussein, and the signs of those wars were clear among more than a few of the middle-aged parishioners. Proud-looking men and several women, with a black patch over a one-screen eye, or cruel scars crawling up the neck to insult an other be and otherwise beautiful face, the result of Iraqi gas attacks or white phosphorus shells. Still, this little community planted a church and flourished in Chicago, USA like the Irish, or the Italians, or the Jews, or the Mandarins, or the Poles, or the Salvadorans. They had a family-first spirit combined with a stiff upper lip and a defiant raspberry to the warlords and tyrants who scapegoated them and turned their homeland into a war zone, forcing them to flee and start over. These were the survivors who managed to get away. About three years ago, when I was a new parent on a sleep-deprived, grumpy, and groggy Saturday afternoon, I was getting home from a grocery run. Nearly home, I rounded the corner towards my house juggling two sacks of groceries and ran smack into a small group of curds spilling from the modest church out into the street. I hid behind my sunglasses. An old man elegant and dignified, yet clearly caught up in the moment. The grandfather of the bride, I learned, accosted me on the sidewalk and asked me, you live here? Your name? As I answered him, two very pretty older women walked up and just took my grocery bags from me. A crowd began to form around me as the old man put his arm around me, and I, I was too polite to do anything about it. The old man, smiling a quintessential old man smile, whispered to me, Nasser, I need you to do something for me. 
He made a sort of theatrical signal to some sharp-looking young men by the door of the church, his hand on my back more urgently pushing me into the crowd. I looked around for my groceries. <laughs> Instead, I was surrounded by all these young, smiling guys slapping me on the shoulder, taking pics on new iPhones, and repeating variations of, Welcome, bro! Just chill a second. I had no idea what was going on. Suddenly, someone in the scrum produced a horn, an actual horn, a blue sequin animal horn with script inlaid in it. Definitely not the kind of thing that one just hands a random guy on the street with baby sit, with baby sit up on his shirt and a sixer of Miller Highlights spilling out of his groceries. And what had happened to those groceries? The old man leaned in and said, we need a stranger for this. Help me. Suddenly, I realized that this was part of the tradition. Kurdish history goes very far back. Like their Jewish contemporaries, the Kurds, an ethnic polity, not a religion, sought strangers. Auspicious persons like the Magi, Negus, or Simon of Cyrene. Auspicious persons to give something symbolic to their most joyful rites, be they Christian, Muslim, Zoroastrian, or secular. So I picked up the horn and blew. A pathetic fart noise came out. <laughs> the man gave me a squeeze on the shoulder and said, You're fine, but, but maybe again? <laughs> Fully realizing the stakes, I nodded grimly, concentrated, channeled my brief seventh grade trumpet career, and really pursed my lips, hung to palate, and blew with all my might. I managed to affect the sound of a yak dying in agony. <laughs> but it was much louder, at least. To my surprise, the wedding party went wild, and the ruckus started right up. The old man had tears in his eyes as the bride, who was stunning, walked out to an absolute uproar of pop guns, fires, crackers, drums, tambourines, and whistles. Everyone was dancing, joyous, hugging, and making noise. From the outside looking in, and I was raised at Episcopalian, these families were, to me, in a moment out of time, living out a part of life tied to an old and proud culture. One of the old man's entourage asked for the horn back, and I obviously obliged, and began looking around for my groceries. <laughs> when I turned my head back around, there were about 20 or so very enthusiastic wedding goers demanding that I take a drink from the horn before I leave. They then proceeded to pour about a quart of some kind of licorice brandy right on down, which I got about halfway through before losing my nerve. It was not yet 3 p.m., and I had a baby waiting at home. After much argument that I stay and party with them, they let me go with thanks, sincere goodbyes, and my groceries. As I left, a crowd of younger folks started dancing and finished what I left in that horn thing with gusto. They were beautiful and kind and neighborly and kind of wild. They were dancing like people overcome with joy to still be on the earth. Thus ends the first time.